point. Very interesting. Yes. You have to do a physical examination, but the Swiss are great mountain climbers, so I'm sure you can do it. Yes, sir, it's good to see you again. We'll talk after the fact and run upstairs. Yeah. 
Yeah, I'll come up here. You're exactly right. 
So good evening. It's my pleasure to welcome you here. Um, my introduction will be very short since it will be followed by the real introduction by the organizer and moderator of this panel, uh, Professor Noam Lubel. Um, my pleasure is to welcome you and to um, open this uh, panel, which uh, is the first in a series of events on uh, issues of international humanitarian law with the Academy or with other partners. If I may just mention on Thursday evening, uh, late afternoon, a uh, panel discussion at the Humanitarium uh, within the, um, the course we are organizing with the ICRC for Diplomacy in Geneva. There will be a major panel discussion with Marco Sassoli, among other people, if I remember well. And next uh, Tuesday uh, at the Villa Moignier, uh, the whole afternoon, um, an event on drones and legitimacy with Gloria Gaggioli, among other people, and again, Marco Sassoli. So the first of the series is on um, the um, topic of human shield. It's the first time, if I'm correct, that uh, the Academy is convening a panel on this very topic, so it's an important date. Uh, the organizer and moderator of uh, the panel has been our AHL chair, Professor Noam Lubel, and I would like to, to thank him especially for having uh, organizing and uh, uh, giving the substance, the basic substance of, the, of this uh, panel. Um, just two words with the support of the Direction du Droit International of our Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Bern. Uh, Professor Lubel uh, is a uh, holder of the AHL chair since September 2013. The role of the chair is to build a bridge uh, between the highest academ academic expertise, uh, which is present at the academy, um, and public events like tonight's panel, and also cross-cutting research uh, on policy issues such as the duty to investigate violations of AHL, uh, which Professor Lubel is presently uh, leading. So I'm pleased uh, to hand over, without further delay, to uh, Noam Lubel, uh, and thank him again for having convened uh, and uh, moderating the, this discussion. I look forward to it. Have a good evening. Thank you very much for, for opening the evening. Uh, thank you to everyone here for joining us. Uh, I think we're also uh, streaming this live, uh, so 
I'll just say hello to all of my students at the University of Essex, who uh, I believe some of whom are gathered in a room with a colleague right now to watch this, and, and they're going to have their own discussion afterwards as well. So uh, the topic of the panel this evening is human shields. And if you think about it, in the last few years, uh, many of us, uh, I know, I know, uh, I think pretty much uh, most of us uh, here on, uh, on this panel have spent a considerable amount of time in recent years looking at all sorts of uh, fancy new topics, uh, in particular around uh, new technologies, cyber operations, drones, uh, autonomous systems. You know, this, is, this is all exciting stuff. Uh, and I, I don't mean to, to say that it's, it's not. It is. It's exciting stuff. It's important stuff. There's a reason that, uh, that many of us have been interested. Uh, it, it requires reflection. But I think occasionally we also need to stop and remind ourselves that some of the uh, perhaps what we call sort of the old-fashioned problems haven't gone away. Uh, and, and we're still stuck with, with many of the debates that have been going on for, uh, for decades. If you look at uh, pretty much any one of the, the conflicts in recent years, it'll be very clear uh, that even when you're dealing with parties that have some of the most sophisticated technologies around, uh, we're still stuck sometimes with challenges and problems and debates over basic issues around the principle of distinction, uh, what are legitimate military targets, how do we interpret proportionality. You know, we're still having these, uh, these problems and, and these debates uh, today as well. And the topic of human shields in many ways is one of the most controversial of all of these. If you look again uh, at, uh, at many of these recent conflicts, you'll find that the parties to the conflicts are often uh, accusing each other of using human shields. Uh, and when they do that, they're, they, they're usually accusing the other side uh, as part of their own efforts to deal with accusations against them for, for uh, causing civilian casualties. They'll say, well, it's not our fault. The other side is using human shields. Uh, and, and that happens time and time again in many of the recent uh, conflicts. If you look at what the law itself says about human shields, and we'll have a lot more of this in detail from our panelists, uh, it focuses mainly on the prohibition, right, on the prohibition of using human shields. And uh, usually the, the, the reference is to uh, essentially using civilians in order to try and render a military uh, target uh, immune to, to attack. Often when we talk about it, we talk about uh, it in the context where a party to the conflict is moving civilians to a military objective. But that doesn't have to be the case. Uh, more generally, uh, it can be spoken about as, uh, as, as really um, a prohibition on intentionally co-locating civilians or other protected per persons, uh, co-locating them with military objectives uh, in this uh, intentional uh, design to try and uh, prevent the military objective from being attacked. And so this, this definition and the prohibition is, is relatively clear. You know, there's some discussion around the, the edges of it, but, but we tend to agree with the principle on, uh, on the prohibition. Uh, where things get messy is what we do when there are allegations that this prohibition has been violated. And, and that's where we tend to have the discussion. Right? So it's not, you know, is there a prohibition on using them or not? Yeah, there is. Fine, that's clear. But then what? Uh, and, and that tends to be the, the, the big problem. There are lots of questions come up. Uh, I've asked our panelists to consider in advance three questions in particular, uh, but uh, they've not been limited to these, uh, to these questions, and uh, some of them may, may choose to, to add a lot more. The questions I've asked them are, firstly, which party, the attacker or the defender, uh, has the, the greater responsibility to avoid civilian casualties? Uh, and the second question I asked was whether the distinction that's sometimes made between voluntary and involuntary human shields, and, and you'll hear more about this, but, but there are some that say that this carries real weight. So are these voluntary human shields or, or, or involuntary? Uh, and I was curious as to whether the panelists think that this distinction is one that is uh, practically realistic and legally relevant. Uh, and then the, the third question uh, that I asked was, how the proportionality rules are affected by uh, the use or allegations of use of human shields. Because we know when we come to the debates over the interpretation of proportionality, uh, 
uh, that uh, some, for example, would argue that, well, human shields uh, shouldn't be counted the same as, as other civilians in proportionality equations. Some people say, oh, they should be counted, but they're worth less. Right? You, you, you have this, this strange formulation sometimes in IHL where different categories of civilians are, are worth different uh, amounts in the proportionality test. So you know, what, what are the views of the panelists on uh, on proportionality. And to answer these questions and a lot more, we have uh, what I, I think is a very exciting panel of speakers. Uh, and I'll, I'll present the three of them now so that I don't have to interrupt the, the flow of the presentations uh, once we get started. Uh, so uh, on the far left, Professor Marco Sassoli is Professor of International Law and Director of the Department of International Law and International Organization at the University of Geneva. Uh, he was also in uh, 2001 to 2003 Professor of International Law at the Université de Québec de Montréal. Uh, he is Commissioner and alternate member of the Executive Committee of the International Commission of Jurists. He's worked for many years during the 80s and 90s uh, for the ICRC, uh, both in headquarters as Deputy Head of the Legal Division uh, and out in the field, uh, Head of Delegation in Jordan, Syria, uh, Protection Coordinator in former Yugoslavia. Uh, he, he made a very bold uh, and courageous uh, move that uh, many or most academics wouldn't even consider when uh, for his sabbatical in uh, 2011 he joined the ICRC delegation in Islamabad to do some more work uh, in the field. And he's also served as a registrar at the Swiss Supreme Court and uh, chair of the board of Geneva Call, which is an NGO that engages uh, non-state armed actors to respect the rules of uh, IHL. Uh, so uh, clearly one of the... Uh, one of today's giants of IHL. Uh, I don't think, Marco, you can, you can lean back, but, but, but everyone here knows that that's the truth. Uh, and uh, next, to, next to Marco, speaking of, of giants of IHL, we have another one. Uh, and, uh, and I'm glad there's room on, uh, on the panel all for so many, <laughs> for all these giants. Um, and Michael Schmidt, Professor, uh, Professor Schmidt is the Charles H. Stockton Professor and Chairman at the United States uh, Naval War College. Um, he's a Francis Lieber Distinguished Scholar at uh, West Point's newly established Lieber Institute for Law and Land Warfare. He's a Professor of Law at the University of Exeter in the UK, and he's a Fellow at Harvard's Law School's uh, Program in International Law and Armed Conflict. Uh, and last but not least, uh, we have Yanina Dill, uh, and I'm, I'm particularly pleased that Yanina has joined us today, and I'll, I'll explain why in a minute. Uh, Yanina is uh, Assistant Professor in Normative International Theory at the Department of International Relations at the London School of Economics and Political Science. She's also a research fellow at the Oxford Institute for Ethics, Law, and Armed Conflict. Uh, she's been a departmental lecturer at the Department of Politics and International Relations at Oxford, where she was also the co-director of the Oxford Institute for Ethics, Law, and Armed Conflict. Uh, and the reason I say I'm, I'm very pleased to have uh, Yanina here is that, as you'll see, I think, from her presentation, she offers a, a unique perspective that we often uh, don't have, and, and I'd say is sometimes missing. Uh, in, these, uh, in these discussions, because she brings in a combination of the, uh, the interaction of the, the legal and the, the moral imperatives. Uh, and as part of that, she, she also conducts a lot of empirical research and interviews with military and uh, civilians in, in conflict areas. So, uh, so we'll, we'll get different perspectives uh, there as well. So I've asked each one of the panelists to speak for up to 15 minutes. Uh, and they'll do that each in turn. And after that, uh, they're going to each have another five minutes just to respond to each other. And we'll then open the floor to questions. Okay, so uh, Mike, you're first. So the reason he's handed me this is because I chronically go long <coughs> And I've had a phone for exactly one month in my life. And this is not even my phone because I don't know how to make it do 15 minutes and start working backwards. So this is Janina's phone. So in the spirit of full disclosure, I'll let you know that. Uh, I'd also, I didn't realize we were being live streamed. So I'd also like to say hello to your students back at Essex. Let me start by... Uh, indicating, first of all, that although I work for the United States government, as you'll see in just a moment, my views decidedly do not reflect uh, those of my government on human shields. As you know, there's been a recently re released document, the Department of Defense Law of War Manual, 
and that law of war manual treats the issue of human shields. I will tell you up front that I don't agree with the treatment in the manual, and I'll explain uh, why in just a moment. So let's take the, uh, the questions that have been asked serially. We'll start with the first one. Which party, the attacker or defender, has greater responsibility to avoid casualties among human shields? So since I'm a lawyer, the first thing I have to do is disagree with the question. I don't know that it's a question of which party has greater responsibility. I think it's a question of, of whether or not both parties in a situation of human shielding continue to shoulder all of their legal obligations. To me, that's the question. And to answer that question, we have to turn to Article 51.8 of the Additional Protocol. Now, that's very important. Now, article 51, as you know, is the article about targeting, targeting uh, individuals. Article 51.8 says there are all these rules on targeting individuals, but if the other side, if the other side violates these rules, then the attacking party is not released from their obligations. So it would answer my revised question, uh, Noam's revised question, in the negative. It doesn't matter if human shields are being used or not. Everyone, the defender that's exploiting the human shields and the attacker that's facing a situation of human shields, everyone continues to bear all their legal obligations. Now, I have to tell you somewhat surprisingly to me, the DOD manual has taken a different approach. And I think it's always important as lawyers that we look at exactly what the text says. So I'm going to read you. I'll do that several times to make sure I get this right. The manual tells us that when the enemy engages in human shielding, quote, commanders should continue to seek to discriminate in conducting attacks and to take feasible precautions to reduce the risk of harm to the civilian population and civilian objects. However, the ability to discriminate and to reduce the risk of harm to the civilian population likely will be diminished by such enemy conduct, the shielding. In addition, and here's the clincher, in addition, such conduct by the adversary does not increase the legal obligation of the attacking party to discriminate in conducting attacks against the enemy. So I think we have to ask ourselves what this really means. I mean, how do you square the concept of, I, I have to continue to seek to discriminate, but that also my legal obligations are in no way affected. That the fact that they're shielding doesn't place greater weight on my shoulders to avoid civilian harm. So to answer what does this mean in the DOD manual, you should always look at the big three of discrimination. The big three are don't shoot civilians, okay? Then you have the rule of proportionality, and then you have take precautions and attack to minimize harm to uh, civilian, civilian objects, take constant care to, to avoid harm to them. So let's take the first one. Can you shoot at the human shields? The DOD manual doesn't say one way or another, but it's only reasonable to assume that the answer is, is you may not shoot at civilians, or at human shields. Why? Because of the next part. In the extract, recall that it said that you had to continue to take feasible precautions to avoid harming those individuals. Well, if you have to take precautions to avoid harming them, obviously you can't shoot at them. So with regard to direct attacks and with regard to the obligation to take feasible precautions, which for uh, states that are party to the additional protocol, that's Article 58, uh, 57 rather, with regard to those two, those are constants. Those remain for the attacking party. The problem is, is with proportionality. Because remember, the U.S. approach in the DOD manual says it can't increase your legal obligation. And if, if those individuals continue to be protected as civilians in the proportionality analysis, then your legal obligation is increased. Why? because you'll have to anticipate greater military advantage in order to harm them without violating the rule of proportionality. So de jure, it does increase your obligation. So the United States would reject application of the rule of proportionality in a human shield situation. Human shields don't count 
in the rule of proportionality. You have to avoid harming them, but they don't count. Later on in the manual, the manual expressly says that. When, they, when the manual gets to the part of proportionality, they say there are certain things that don't count, and the third of three, human shields. And then it goes on to say who's responsible, answering Noam's original question. It says, the party that employs human shields in an attempt to shield military objectives from attack assumes responsibility for their injury provided the attacker takes feasible precautions in conducting an attack. So if, as long as I'm careful to avoid harming them, the fact that he's used human shields means he's responsible for the harm that befalls them during my attack, not me. And it sets forth its rationale. It says, if the proportionality rule were interpreted to permit the use of human shields to prohibit attacks, such an interpretation would perversely encourage the use of human shields and allow violations by the defending force to increase the legal obligations on the attacking force. In other words, if those human shields count, and I have to take them into consideration in the proportionality analysis, civilians will be placed at risk. Why? Because you'll want to use civilian shields to preclude me as a matter of law from conducting my attack because I'm at risk of violating the rule of proportionality. Now, that's an approach with which I disagree. And my view is that uh, all of the ICRC, my view is that both parties in a human shielding situation continue to shoulder all their obligations under IHL. And I believe that's true regardless of whether you're an additional protocol one state, like most of you, or if you're from the United States like me, which is not an additional party one state because I believe that's a customary norm. Why? It's because when IHL wants to relieve a party of obligations, it says so expressly, either through customary law or through treaty law. So I'll give you the example of the law of reprisals. As you know, reprisals have been outlawed in the additional, in great part, in the additional protocol. My country doesn't believe that's customary, but at least there is a mechanism for relieving the party of its obligations. You violate the law, okay? The mechanism is I get to violate the law to force you back into compliance with the law. So there are mechanisms, and with regard to this particular issue, no such mechanisms exist that I'm aware of. The only thing I can think of is the argument that it's militarily necessary. But the idea that we can violate the law because it's militarily necessary has been rejected for a period measured in decades and now even centuries. So what about the DOD's argument? Well, this will encourage, okay? What about that argument? Well, first, I think it will endanger civilians. If you take my approach, which is they count in the proportionality analysis, that does endanger civilians because a malevolent defender can indeed shift the proportionality equation for me. That malevolent defender can make it legally impermissible for me to conduct my attack. That's true. But I have to ask myself, what's going to endanger them more? The malevolent defender or relieving me, me of my obligation to take them into consideration in my proportionality analysis. Relieving me of the obligation to say, oh, they're, hey, hey, they're shields, it doesn't matter. We don't count them. I suspect the answer is that the second is more dangerous. The idea that you relieve people of legal obligations is more dangerous than the law being exploited to the, to the benefit of one side or another. Now, I would note that the DOD manual caught us by surprise and the on this issue. And the reason it caught us by surprise is that because before there was a DOD manual has the most recent U.S. statement of policy and law in the, in the IHL field, there was a naval warfare pamphlet called the Commander's Handbook on the Law of Naval Operations, okay? How do I know this? I know this because my office is responsible for producing that document. The Naval War College produces that document. I will read you what that document said. 
it said that although the principle of proportionality underlying the concept of collateral damage continues to apply in such cases, the presence of civilians does not preclude attack. In such cases, and that's where proportionality applies, responsibility for the injury and or death of such civilians, if any, falls on the belligerent so employing them. In other words, proportionality applies, and if you use human shields, you're responsible for their death as a matter of law. I would suggest that that was a correct statement of law. Now on to the second question, and this is where we're going to have entertainment here today because there's going to be a disagreement. The second question has to do with, does, is there a difference between voluntary and involuntary shields, and is, is there a practical way to implement such a difference? My answer is yes and yes. One view is that all human shields, whether they're there voluntarily or they've been forced to be a human shield, enjoy all the protections of IHL. I believe that's my friend Marco's view, but I'll let him speak for himself. My view is a little bit different. Although I believe that involuntary shields are never relieved of the protections they enjoy under humanitarian law, I believe that voluntary shields are direct participants in hostilities. Um, uh, Professor uh, Sassoli and I were involved in the direct participation in hostilities uh, project run by the ICRC, so we know this subject well. I believe the ICRC and its interpretive guidance got the conditions for direct participation right. They have three conditions, and I believe they nailed it. The problem is in the application of those conditions. In particular, the interpretive guidance, the ICRC, distinguishes between physically serving as an obstacle to attack and serving as an obstacle to attack as a matter of law. So the ICRC takes the view that if I go and I stand on a bridge, and there's a tank coming over the bridge, but I stand there like that, that that is me directly participating in hostilities such that I lose the protections of IHL for the period during which I so participate. But that if your voluntary actions result in a legal obstacle, as distinct from a physical obstacle, that, that doesn't, it doesn't operate the same way. Well, to me, this doesn't make any sense at all, because why in the world does it matter? You're there on your own volition, you're trying to affect enemy operations, why does it matter if you're there physically or you engage in a volitional act that has the consequence of shutting down the enemy's operations? In such a case, it strikes me as direct participation, and indeed, it's much more effective in many cases. Because remember, if I get enough human shields on top of a target, the prohibition on attack is absolute. It's unlawful to attack them or to attack the target with the human shields there because I will breach the proportionality rule. But by contrast, if I'm physically blocking a bridge, as an example, I will get some of my soldiers and I will have them removed. How is it possible that a volitional act that absolutely prevents me from conducting my operation is not direct participation, but one that is a nuisance, is a hindrance to my operation is. How is it possible that the person on the bridge loses their protection, but not the person on top of the target that precludes me from attacking? I, I don't understand the logic, and therefore I believe that voluntary shields are in fact Voluntary shields are, in fact, direct participants. They may be attacked directly. I'll get to that in a second. They don't count in the precautions in attack analysis, um, and they do, they do not count in a proportionality analysis. Now, let me turn to the second part of the second. I'm not, in case you're panicking about time, I'm not going to do the third question, okay? Good, I have seven more minutes, okay? No, no, I'll, 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 go, I'll go fast, I'll go fast. Is it possible to apply this, my approach, in, in practice? The answer is absolutely yes. Why? Because we often know that people are voluntary human shields. Why? Because they tell us so. They want us to know so that our operation is precluded. If, if we don't know that they are voluntary shields, then pursuant to the law, IHL, we have to presume that they are not 
voluntary human shields, that they are there involuntarily. This is the rule of doubt. Now, this is problematic because the DOD manual takes a very restrictive approach to the notion of doubt and tells us that there is no presumption of civilian status. This is not something with which I agree. And the reason I don't agree is when a commander, when a warfighter is looking at a target, he or she doesn't presume it's civilian or not. They look at the target and they try to figure out what is that. Then, if doubt remains, and such doubt that would cause a warfighter to hesitate, a reasonable warfighter in same or similar circumstance, then the presumption applies. It's not an irrebuttable presumption. It's a presumption that only applies in the case that there's doubt remaining uh, after you take a look at the target area or the specific target. Last comment, and I, and I, and I will quit. The DOD approach, though, is appealing. I kind of like it in one respect. The problem with my view is, do we really want to say that IHL permits me to go kill that direct participant, that, that voluntary human shield? I don't think you want me to do that. I will tell you, as someone who's been with the military most of my life, we don't do that because it doesn't make any sense. We're expending ammunition unnecessarily. It will turn, it will turn the international media against us. We'll lose support in our own country. We don't do that. But do we really want the law to get to that answer? I actually like the DOD approach with regard to voluntary human shields. I like that you can't target them. I like that you must take them into consideration when you're calculating what precautions you can take to avoid harming them. I like the fact that I would be obligated to avoid harming them if I can. I just don't want them to count in the proportionality analysis because I believe that they are shifting in a way that, that states did not agree to at the time these rules came into play, that states did not agree to and that would not accept today. So uh, uh, disagree with the DOD manual, but if we can shift it over time, I like the approach very much, but only for voluntary human shields. And now I will sit down. for having me on the panel and uh, thank you for having me speak right after Mike Schmidt, um, which I consider an honor and also a challenge because we do disagree on a number of issues. Yeah. <laughs> um, on the question of responsibility, um, I don't think it should at all surprise us that this question is so at the forefront of media commentary, public commentary, political commentary, right? When civilians die, we need somebody to blame. We will all remember that in 2014, um, during the invasion of Gaza by the IDF, we had many public statements, many official statements, for instance, the Israel envoy to UNHCR saying, well, the IDF isn't supposed to be blamed for all those casualties because Hamas is allegedly using human shields, so they are supposed to be blamed. And any such commentary was immediately met then with a barrage of opposing commentary blaming the IDF, absolving Hamas. Yet, I venture it is surprising and misguided um, that this question is so much at the heart of expert commentary on IHL and on the question of how we legally regulate the conduct of hostilities. And here I just quote a little bit about that Mike Schmidt left off in, from the uh, 2015 United States Law of War Manual. It states, the party that employs human shields in an attempt to shield military objectives from attack assumes responsibility for their injury. I'd like to make two points with regard to the responsibility question. The first, that these statements, including the one just quoted from the US Law of War Manual, are profoundly conceptually misguided when they imply that allocating responsibility to one side absolves the other. It is perfectly possible, both legally and morally, that two independent agents are fully responsible for the death of an innocent person. The second and arguably more important point in a discussion of IHL is that this responsibility question, responsibility of, for harmful outcomes of an attack, is not what determines the parameters under which it is permissible to attack a human shield or a military objective. 
Our interpretation of IHL, the permissibility of attacking an object that is shielded by voluntary or involuntary civilians, the question who is responsible for their death is of decidedly limited relevance. Let's start with the first point and the question of what do we actually mean when we say responsible? What does the US law of war manual <coughs> when it says, means when it says the user of human shields is responsible, not the attacker? They could mean something like causal responsibility. However, that seems so obvious that it hardly needs statement. Of course, the user is causally responsible for the death of the human shield. But so, and it's equally obvious, is the attacker, right? Both fulfill the conceptually but for test. If the user hadn't used the human shields, encouraged them to stay or coerced them to stay near the military objective, they wouldn't be dead. If the attacker hadn't attacked, they wouldn't be dead. That's what we call causal responsibility. So in some ways, the US law of war manual must mean something else, must mean something more. And what it may mean is something like moral or legal responsibility, possibly blameworthiness. And specifically, the drafters seem to imply that if the user of human shields is to be blamed, then the attacker isn't. And that is where the problem lies, right? Let me give you an example. Imagine I know that Professor Lubell drives a tank across a bridge every morning at 7.30, right? I want to kill my neighbor, and I come up with the idea of tying my neighbor to that bridge, counting on the fact that Professor Lubell will drive across him and kill him. Next morning, as expected, Professor Lubell rocks up in his tank, right? sees my neighbor tied to the bridge, ponders his choice, drives across him and kills him. Now, very few people of us would want to say that Professor Lubell is not legally or morally responsible for killing my neighbor. Right? At the same time, us finding that he is responsible doesn't mean I am not, doesn't even diminish the moral or legal responsibility that I have. Right? Moral and legal responsibility aren't finite cakes, and the more I give to one, the less I have for the other. More blame for the user of human shields doesn't mean less blame for the attacker. Of course, before we move from moral or legal responsibility to blame, we would want to ask questions about excuse, justification, intention. But this, I think, would move us too far away from IHL, which, after all, is the topic of discussion. And for the purposes of IHL, and this is my second point on the responsibility question, it doesn't actually have to arise the question of ex post facto responsibility for the death of human shields. The permissibility of conduct in war is a different question. Let me give you another example. Imagine an attacker foreseeably but unintentionally kills a number of civilians in an attack on a military objective. The attacker is clearly morally and legally responsible for the foreseen outcome of her actions. Right? Yet, if the anticipated military of advantage of the attack meant the expected collateral harm, the killing of the civilians, wasn't excessive, then the attack is perfectly permissible under IHL. So responsibility for harmful consequences of an attack does not mean the attack is impermissible. That, to some extent, works the other way around as well. Right? Lack of ex post facto responsibility for harmful consequences of an attack is not sufficient, it may not even count towards the permissibility of an attack under IHL. It gets a bit more complicated, but let me give you another example. Imagine an attacker launches an intentional attack against a civilian home. The attacker has no reason to believe and cannot possibly know that there are civilians in the basement. She has no way to verify this, and under all standards of moral and legal due diligence, she couldn't possibly have known there were civilians in the basement. So the death of the civilians is genuinely unforeseen and unforeseeable, which puts a question mark over her moral and legal responsibility for the harmful outcome. Let's make this even more stark and say she isn't morally blameworthy either, because in this particular instance, her attacking that empty house was the lesser evil to appease a very devious military superior who wanted her to attack another house, and she knew there were civilians in that basement. Right? So she's neither straightforwardly, legally, or morally responsible for the outcome, nor is she blameworthy. Yet, the attack is blatantly illegal under IHL. Right? It was the intentional attack on an object that did not generate a military advantage. So, a um, violation of article, the definition of Article 52.2. So, blameworthiness, moral or legal responsibility ex post facto have no bearing on the legality of an attack, the permissibility of which under IHL hinges on intent.
Of course, logically, an action ha that has no causal connection to an outcome will not, on the basis of that outcome, be prohibited, right? That's a matter of logic. But what is crucial and what I really want to drive home here is that moral and legal responsibility for the harmful outcome of an attack or the absence of moral or legal responsibility for the harmful outcome of an attack has no bearing on the IHL. So if we wanted to argue, really wanted to argue that an attacker has no moral responsibility for the death of human shields, and I don't think it can be easily argued, but say we go with that argument of the DOD, nothing would follow for the permissibility of the attack under IHL. And just to drive home the point about um, responsibility not being a zero-sum game, IHL is obviously not in the business of allocating ex post facto responsibility or blame, but international criminal law is. Right? And here it is easily imaginable, imaginable, at least conceptually speaking, that one terrible attack on a military objective shielded by a great number of coerced civilians generates both a conviction for the intentional use of human shields for the user of the human shields, and at least in theory, a conviction for the attacker for having launched an attack in the knowledge that the civilian harm would be clearly excessive in relation to the anticipated overall military advantage. This isn't particularly likely, right? International criminal law and proportionality don't go together so well. But nothing in the structure of international criminal law prevents us from holding responsible both the attacker and the user of human shields. Because like moral and legal responsibility, criminal responsibility is by no means indivisible. But let me move on to the second question, which is um, whether the distinction between voluntary and involuntary human shields is practically uh, realistic and legally relevant. And Professor Schmidt answered with yes and yes, and I'll answer with no and no. So let's start. I'll make two points again, one about what the law is and one about what it should be. And I think they're both relevant here, but ultimately, the law is what it should be. But bear with me for a minute. We'll start with what the law is. Um, there are only two categories of persons under IHL, civilians and combatants. Right? This is not a moral argument. This is black letter exegesis. A person is either one or the other. And a civilian is immune from attack for as long as she does not directly participate in hostilities. I imagine the audience is largely familiar with those rules. That is the relevant and the only relevant dividing line in contemporary and treaty customary IHL, and there's no such thing as a civilian who counts less than one civilian because of her voluntary conduct, unless that conduct meets the requirements of direct participation in hostilities. There are some very eminent scholars, I don't think on the panel, but in the community, who want to hold on to the notion of a quasi-combatant, which is captured by the archetype of a munitions worker in the Second World War. I do not see how that is a sound interpretation of Lex Lata for Geneva Conventions later. Interestingly enough, the um, US Law of War Manual comes out in support of this notion of a third category, right? And they mention the munitions worker, the voluntary munitions worker. And in the footnote, um, which is supposed to you know, convince you of the notion that this is the law, not merely what they want the law to be, they cite expert commentary and indeed the ICRC. And these statements all center on and refer to the increased responsibility that a voluntary munitions worker takes and the risk they assume by working in a munitions factory. So what grounds this idea of a third category of the quasi-combatant is again a conceptual conflation between, on the one hand, the idea of how much risk and responsibility does anybody assume for a harmful consequence in war and the permissibility of an attack. So if they're not the legally relevant categories, if the relevant category is DPH or no DPH, why is international humanitarian law discourse so preoccupied with the distinction between voluntary and involuntary human shield? I think the reason is that it tracks a very powerful intuition about what the law should be, not what it actually is. And the reason is that it is an expression of our intuition that the choices of a civilian in war should matter, right? What happens to a civilian in war should be, to some extent at least, a result of her choices. The point I want to make is that the distinction between voluntary and involuntary human shields, the way it is used now in legal discourse, does not actually track those intuitions properly. If we wanted to make the law fair or just, right, in the sense that what you do as a civilian determines what you deserve, how you're treated, and this is then how the law will make you be treated, 
we would need a much, much more nuanced legal categories than just voluntary and involuntary human shields. If we had such a more nuanced law, I would venture it would not be, as the question puts it, practically relevant anymore. It would be militarily useless, too complex, and possibly therefore have perverse moral consequences. So let me explain that a little bit. There's probably not very much contestation over the notion that coerced or involuntary human shields retain their immunity from attack. Right? And that broadly tracks our intuition. The problem lies with the category of voluntary human shield and the notion that all voluntary human shields directly participate and are therefore targetable, or at least count less somehow. Let me give you an example. The problem here is that not all voluntary conduct is created equal. Right? Imagine the father of four who receives a warning that his house will be bombed um, because a belligerent has stored rockets in the basement. The father doesn't want to leave the house in the hope that he can shield it from attack, right? saving his life's work, preventing the homelessness of his family. And he invites over a family friend to bring up the number of civilians, hoping to make it less likely that the house gets attacked. Compare that to a man who hears about the impending attack on an IED workshop, a house used as an IED workshop on the outskirts of his town. And in an effort to help his troops, he drives their climbs on the roof, hoping to shield the house from attack. Both the father and the men intend to shield a military objective from attack. But their motives, reasons, overriding justification make those actions morally significantly different. And this difference isn't merely captured in active versus passive conduct. Right? If you take the family friend, this is an active behavior, active conduct in order to shield a house from attack. Of course, for someone to count as a voluntary human shield in the way it is often used in legal debate, it doesn't, isn't even necessary that the primary intent of that person is to shield an object. Right? We have eminent voices in the community who use the term voluntary human shield simply for any non-coerced conduct that knowingly makes a military objective less likely to be attacked. So vary the first example with the father and the four children and say he doesn't actually intend to shield his house at all. Right? He just prioritizes the well-being of his family members not wanting to subject them to the stress of displacement. In effect, he shields this house, but this is a side effect of his intention to protect his family. It is not at all what he intends. Yet, if you look at it from the outside, from the perspective of the commander faced with the task of applying the law, that father looks exactly like the father who intends to shield the house from attack. And the father who intends to shield his house from attack doesn't look all that different from the family friend who comes over to help. And from the outside, the family friend coming over, intending to shield the house in order to prevent the homelessness of a civilian family, looks more or less the same from a man driving to the outskirts of his town, climbing on the roof of an IED workshop, intending to shield it in order to help the troops. Right. The bottom line is that law has to draw bright lines to work. And it does draw these bright lines. And there are civilian versus combatant and civilian that is directly participating in hostilities and civilians that aren't. As these categories do not track voluntary versus involuntary human shield in the way that, these, that they are used, they are not the legally relevant categories. Because the distinction between voluntary and involuntary human shield wouldn't actually make the law any fairer or morally more appropriate if we simply assumed that all voluntary human shields were anything but immune civilians, there is no reason why the law should accommodate them either. And this, to some extent, answers the third question, which is whether the proportionality rule in its application is affected by the use of human shields. There's no such thing as a civilian counting as less than one civilian, right? There's a civilian that is immune from attack, and then there's a civilian who is a permissible intentional target of attack because they're directly participating in hostilities. I don't know whether it's such a great consolation for the law that it would be a waste of ammunition to attack them. Right? The law still has to deal with the question whether it would be legitimate. So the question isn't, do you think the father shielding his house from homelessness, the family friend coming over, the man driving to the outskirts of town hoping to help his troops, whether they should count more or less. The question is, do you think that they should be direct intentional targets of attack because they're directly participating in hostilities. And I think you can find a lot of examples of voluntary human shields that fulfill the two criteria of hostile intent and belligerent nexus, specifically if they follow an invitation to shield an object in the concerted effort. 
But what I think they lack, right, even the easiest case of a voluntary human shield who intends to shield an object in order to help the troops, if it is a pure legal shielding, they do not cause harm, properly so-called. And that doesn't mean it's trivial, right? That doesn't mean they don't have any effect on military operation. But we have to ask, what does harm mean, or what should harm mean for the purposes of the law? For a human shield, what it could mean is you make winning harder, right? And it can't possibly mean that, right? Otherwise, too many people would directly participate in hostilities, anybody who would contribute to the resilience of a society. You could say, well, it means they are actually reducing the number of available courses of action to the military on the other side. That's not trivial. I'm not saying that at all. Right? But I'm saying it is not causing harm. Because if you take away the intent, right, the intent to help the troops, it is a pro completely unproblematic conduct. Civilians reduce the margin of maneuver of the opposing belligerent all the time simply in virtue of being civilians and living where they live. Yet direct participation usually doesn't only involve hostile intent, but also inherently problematic conduct, conduct that would be problematic even if we weren't sure about the intent. And the last way in which you can think about, well, this is harmful, is by saying, well, if I attack nonetheless, right, you're driving up my proportionality count and imposing reputational costs in the court of public opinion, surely that's harmful. But again, I would say, if that is harm, Right? If that is what we want to harm to understand, the threshold of harm for the purposes of DPH, then anybody who takes pictures and writes vividly on the internet about the human misery of war causes harm to the belligerent imp imposing that misery. So for these reasons of really, you know, it's a teleological, but also really just a common sense textual interpretation of harm, I do not think that all voluntary human shields are directly participating in hostilities unless they're also physical shields. So a number of scholars, like the US Law of War Manual, come back with arguments like this is unfair, right? It creates a moral hazard because it encourages the defender to use human shields. We must be clear that these are arguments about what the law should be, not what it is, which is surprising in the Law of War Manual, but it's there, right? And I hope we get back to this in the discussion. My time is almost up. My time is actually up. So I hope we get back to this in the discussion because I think neither the moral hazard argument nor the fairness argument are actually grounds for changing the law, they're both mistaken. But if I want to end on the note of what the law is, then here I agree with Professor Schmidt, it is enshrined in AP1 Article 51, last paragraph. The opposing belligerents' misdeeds do not release you from your obligations. They, the protection of the civilian is no longer assimilated to the misdeeds of their belligerent party. That is the bottom line that means that 10 civilian who unwittingly pass an IED workshop if they make an attack disproportionate, so make te do 10 civilians who voluntarily shield that IED workshop. Thanks. Good afternoon. Uh, welcome. Thank you to both of you, because somehow you relieved me of my task. I agree with Michael, except where Janina disagrees with him. Uh, that's it. Simply, perhaps, I must say, I appreciated very much the arguments by Janina, some of which I didn't think about. Uh, I will tell you uh, simply my arguments. We have often discussed that, so now you hear the same arguments than before. Well, uh, with her, you heard some new ones. Um, I think the starting point, which was the first question, and I suggest it should even be broader, is who has the main responsibility for the protection of civilians, and that's the attacker, full stop. It's a shared responsibility, but it's not an equal responsibility. Clearly, under international humanitarian law, it's the, the main responsibility is with the attacker. And the rules about the defender, Article 58 of Protocol 1, are much softer, endeavor to avoid except if, and if you look at interpretation by state practice, most states don't take any passive precautions. Uh, 
and therefore I'm astonished that the ICAC considers that this is a customary rule, it, because passive precautions would already have to be taken in peacetime. I'm not aware, but please tell me, uh, that in the planning laws, this should already be in the planning laws when we decide, and recently the people of the town of Geneva decided to move military barracks out of town, no one made the argument. In Geneva, the hometown of the Geneva Conventions and of the Geneva Academy and so on, that this was because of Article 58. And I'm not aware of any other country taking such decisions based on the idea we have an obligation to separate uh, military objectives from the civilian population, and they don't evacuate, fortunately, civilians from towns, and they don't uh, renounce to defend towns. They don't say, say the Swiss army doesn't say, we go on the arms to fight. They say, we defend Geneva. Unfortunately, they don't evacuate Geneva before, because if you evacuate Geneva, you have to feed the people, you have to find water, education, and so on. Okay. Now, this is not really the human shield issue, but it's the framework. The only hard law obligation a defender has is not to use human shields. Whether they are voluntary or involuntary, it's absolutely prohibited. It's a war crime. Uh, I may notice under the state, I didn't make the statute of the International Criminal Court. Uh, I'm innocent. It's only a war crime in international armed conflicts. I know you file case states don't matter. Well, states decided they wanted to make it only a war crime in international armed conflicts, perhaps because of the reason uh, that in non-international armed conflict, my argument of the defender not wanting to separate himself from the civilian population is even stronger because the defender has, in a non-international armed conflict, the government has also an obligation to protect the civilian population and therefore has to have a police station in the middle of the village if the rebels are around because it has to protect the civilian population from the rebels from a human rights point of view, while under IHL, obviously, it should move the police station out of the village. So that's an interesting issue. Anyway, what makes the difference between lack of passive precautions, which nearly everyone does, and totally prohibited taking of human shields, it's a question of intent to deliberately try to achieve force protection by using the prohibition to attack civilians. And I think that's important. It's not just co-locating. If the intent of the defender is just to hide military objectives and combatants, and the attacker is simply no longer able to know where are they, this is not taking the civilians as human shields. It's only if the human shields are known, but the attacker will hopefully not attack the human shield, uh, no, the military objectives, because there are human shields on the military objectives, and because the attacker wants to comply with IHL, that this is actually the prohibited conduct, and it's a question of intent. The difference between taking human shields and lack of passive precautions is what is the intent of the defender. Okay, now comes the question, and what happens, ooh, which was discussed, what happens uh, to the human shield? First, uh, Article 51.8 is worth to be read, also it was already summarized. It says, any violations of these prohibitions, including in the preceding paragraph, 
the prohibition to use human shields, shall not release the parties to the conflict from their legal obligations with respect to the civilian population and civilians, including the obligation, including, not only, including, uh, the obligation to take precautionary measures provided for in Article 57. So, first, for the proportionality issue, and here I agree with Michael, um, indeed, it is true that a defender who takes human shields assumes responsibility, is responsible in the legal sense, has committed a violation and even a war crime. But this doesn't mean that the civilians are less civilians. I mean, it's not their responsibility. It's the responsibility of the party. Mm. So, uh, and then those who suggest, including eminent IHL and human rights lawyers like Louise Doswald Beck, who is not really a uh, um, very military person, uh, who suggest that they count less, I must say, uh, how does that work, that some people count more, some people count less, and anyway, for the time being, hopefully this will change, uh, for the time being, the proportionality rule is so vague that I don't know how you would say, okay, how you count less. This is probably for a computer program or something like that. Now I come to the central issue uh, where we disagree, that's the old play, on voluntary involuntary human shields. Now, if Michael Schmidt is correct, his argument is self-defeating to say, if human shields actually, voluntary human shields, directly participate in hostilities, it doesn't change anything for the attacker. It's as if the attacker puts soldiers on the uh, military objective, because he says they directly participate. And so, whether he puts civilians who directly participate, or, the, or he puts uh, combatants on the military objective, in both cases, they don't count. But if they don't count, they don't harm in any sense. And for the rest, I agree with Janina on uh, what harm means. Uh, in the, they don't harm the attacker in any way. The attacker can continue to attack as if they were not there. So they, con they don't contribute in any way, if his theory is correct. Okay, but this is the presupposition because direct participation must at least harm. In addition, I would say it does uh, not uh, physically harm, but legally harm. This was well explained by Janina. I would simply add the IHL professor, say our common friend Joram Dinstein, he, um, he says uh, every bridge is a military objective. I say no. Now, if I speak in the TV and say bridges may not be attacked except blah, 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 somehow I harm the attacker. And therefore, I would be a lawful target. I directly participate in hostilities in this terminology because I hinder the enemy legally to attack because I have good arguments. And that's the same thing with the human shields. They somehow, through themselves, make legal arguments. A little parenthesis here. The phenomenon of voluntary human shields, to the best of my knowledge, is not so widespread as it is always descriptive. I know only of one case in the West Bank and one case in Gaza, because most of the time those human shields declaring, for instance, there were US citizens citizen in Iraq, they simply go on a hospital, on a bridge, but a bridge which even uh, um, Joram Dinstein wouldn't call a, a military objective, a, so they go 
on a place which is anyway not a military objective and therefore they are not voluntary human sheets. I'm not aware of plenty of US citizens who went to Baghdad to go uh, on the roof of the military headquarters. So it's rather rare. Let's come back to my argument about voluntary human shields. It also presupposes that you can distinguish who is voluntary and who is un involuntary. Now, uh, I teach near a bridge uh, at uh, my university, and the people who take cheap apartments near the bridge because they studied IHL and they know in wartime, according to Joram Dinstein, that's a military objective, are they voluntary or involuntary human shields? But even, unfortunately, more tragical, is the example of the spouse of the Taliban. And uh, NATO states often said the Taliban anyway takes human shields. And often the Taliban is together with his wife and his children. Let's take the wife. Does that mean that the pilot has to determine whether this was a love marriage or a forced marriage, and if it is a forced marriage, it's an involuntary human shield, and otherwise it's a voluntary human shield. Well, I don't think so. And also the intent, it's very difficult to determine the intent of the defender for the attacker uh, in a conduct of hostility situation, and I told you the difference between of, uh, human shields and lack of precautions is a question of intent. In addition, unfortunately, the concept of military objective is uh, controversial. And therefore, it's only on military objectives that I'm a human shield, which would mean a voluntary human shield if I go on the bridge as According to me, this is not a military objective. I'm not a voluntary human shield. While on the same bridge, Joram Dijtan is a voluntary human shield because he considers that it is a military objective. Now, these may sound to you as jokes. What is behind all this is the risk of abuse and of tranquilizing the conscience of the attacker that the attacker simply says, because no one, or nearly no one, I know some sadists everywhere, but few people really like to kill civilians. And therefore, they took precautions, even when they were not told by law professors to take precautions not to kill civilians. But if they are told, look, it's not your fault, it's their fault, these are human shields, these are voluntary human shields, then the attacker feels absolved and has somehow a tranquilization of the conscience. And anyway, they cannot verify whether it's true. And most of the time, they will not declare, we are human shields here on a military objective. And there are plenty of people who have written, unfortunately, they do not agree with Michael Schmidt that it is only if the people have declared or it's otherwise clear. I have read in a publication situational human shields are also uh, voluntary human shields. And this is the danger of the whole debate on human shields, which is quite secondary, but that it leads to a situation where people do no longer feel responsible for killing civilians. Thank you. Is this working? Yes. So uh, thank you all for your presentations. Uh, before we open up to questions, I'll, I'll give you a, a quick chance to, uh, to respond to each other. But if, if I can just throw into the mix uh, before your responses uh, a quick thought on this issue of uh, voluntary and involuntary. Um, because beyond uh, Yanina's point about uh, the, the law simply doesn't contain uh, the, these categories and, and therefore we shouldn't be uh, using them, um, I'm also not certain 
whether they're, they're actually helpful, even, Mike, even from your perspective, whether you actually need uh, to make this distinction or, or can't we just simply use the, the DPH um, as, uh, as the only test where, I mean, you might argue that voluntary are always DPH, but um, I, I would try and think whether I can imagine a situation where a so-called voluntary human shield is not taking a direct part in hostilities, uh, and here, um, let's use uh, Nina's example of the individual who's, who just doesn't want their home to be bombed, right? But there's a munitions uh, being, being, being kept in the basements. The, the home is a military target. They really don't want that to happen, so they stay in the house hoping it won't be bombed, right? Now, actually, most people would say one civilian casualty, it's still proportionate, so, in effect, they're not necessarily causing any harm, right? If you say, you know, they're a voluntary legal human shield, they actually cause no harm because the other side can, can still target this, uh, this, this house, doesn't even have to worry about the individual being there from the proportionality perspective. Now, if we say that this means the person is taking a direct part in hostilities, it means that the attacker uh, can bomb the house and doesn't even have to care that the civilian's there. Whereas if we say that this person uh, isn't taking a direct part in hostilities, even though they're doing it voluntarily, but it's not direct part in hostilities because it's not causing any harm, then if the attacker has the choice between, uh, say, the weapons that they use, one weapon that would destroy the munitions in the basement but leave the person alive, and another that would just destroy the whole house and, uh, and kill them, then we'd say they have an obligation to, to try and uh, carry out the attack without killing the individual. So, so to my mind, that's an example where, where you have a so-called voluntary human shield uh, that's not taking a direct part in hostilities and, and, and the effect makes a difference. Likewise, can we imagine a situation of an involuntary human shield that is taking a direct part in hostilities? You know, and uh, here, you know, come back to the basic direct participation in hostilities. If someone is, is uh, standing over there pointing a gun at me and, and about to fire, uh, and I know that there's a possibility that just behind the corner there's someone else pointing a gun at them, telling them to shoot me, to me, that doesn't make any difference. You know, my, my reading of whether this person is taking a direct part in hostilities now is going to be the same uh, either way. Uh, it'll depend on how you interpret the, the ICSC criteria, but, but the act of, of them shooting at me is an act intended to cause harm, right? I mean, we don't use the, you know, the at least the, the ICSC definition doesn't get into questions of you know, duress and so on and why they're doing it. it. It is an act that is clearly intended to cause harm. From my perspective, that person is taking a direct part in hostilities. You could argue that they're doing so involuntarily. So likewise with human shields. I mean, it doesn't matter if, if it, and it goes both ways, you see, to, to me. You can have the voluntary human shield that's not taking a direct part and the involuntary that perhaps is. And the, the only test that maybe makes a difference really is, is simply the direct participation. We can have a debate over which acts are direct participation, but that's the test that, that we should be using. So I'd just like to sort of throw out that, that possibility uh, uh, out uh, into, the, into the mix. Uh, and really now, if you, if you just want to briefly, but not another presentation, as we said, just a, just a brief response uh, to each other, and then we'll open up and there'll be, I'm sure, a chance for a lot more. Uh, with the answers to some of the questions. So Mike, let's, let's go in the same order, if you want to go first. Yep. <clears throat> so let me start with Janina. Uh, you know, I have to say, uh, so Marco and I have been doing this for a lot of years, and there, there's not much new after all this time. Uh, we were involved in the DPH together, we were involved in AMW together, where we addressed this, and on and on and on. Janine, I have to compliment you. It's the most creative presentation I've heard on this subject in quite some time. And it was really, really thoughtful. Um, it's creative a compliment? Yeah. No, no, it's, a very, uh, it's very much a compliment, meant to be a compliment. So let me answer a few of your questions, though, because we need to be careful about what I was talking about. It's, you know, since you're disagreeing with me and some, I want to tell you exactly what I was talking about. I'm only talking about the legal responsibility of the state. I'm making no, certainly not me of all people, I'm making no conclusions with regard to moral responsibility. I'm making no conclusions with regard to individual criminal responsibility, economic responsibility, any other form of responsibility other than the responsibility of a state pursuant to the law of state responsibility for an internationally wrongful act, that wrongful act being a violation of IHL. I think your point on allocating responsibility doesn't absolve 
the other party of responsibility is a very good one. There are circumstances. I use human shields, but you violate the proportionality analysis. But you, it's a very good point. Uh, what does the DOD manual mean? Exactly what I meant. The DOD manual has nothing to do with moral conclusions whatsoever. It is strictly law. It's the DOD Law of War Manual. I will tell you that we do address, I can only speak for the US military, moral issues a lot. I teach at a war college, which is where we teach our most senior officers. They spend a year with us, those who will go on to become commanders and general officers. Uh, we have a professor of, uh, of ethics. We have an actual uh, block of instruction on ethics. What we teach our people is that the law is the box, and ethics will narrow down the permissible attack, along with other factors, by the way, like operational concerns. But ethics, I mean, law, that's the outer limit. Then you look to your moral compass to decide whether or not you want to pull the trigger. I agree with you absolutely on the no third category. Uh, to me, though, uh, a new category, direct participation in hostilities, law been recognized. It's in both AP1, AP2. To me, that's a valid category, and we can play with that. So I always, I, I sometimes accuse Marco of what I'm going to accuse you of, okay? First of all, not Marco on this one. I, I want to make, I, I want you to understand that my view is that, it's at least my view, IHL isn't about being fair or just or moral. IHL is a cold calculation made by states who are negotiating with each other. And they make this negotiation by balancing two competing concerns. They are military necessity and humanitarian considerations. In other words, states want to be humanitarian, but only to the extent that it's militarily sensible. And that's one of the reasons why I focus a great deal on the involuntary voluntary shields, because the warfighters that I talk to don't find it's sensible to say those individuals can absolutely preclude me from conducting my attack, but I can't attack them. However, I can shoot the little old lady on the cell phone that just observes movements in and out of my forward operating base. So I, I think in your presentation, you overemphasized factors that are not part of IHL interpretation. Now, and this is my last point. I agree with most of what uh, Marco said. And this would be for both of you. There, we, we seem to be caught up in the issue of what is harm. Mm -hmm. Because remember, that's the first constitutive element. It's the first thing you have to find, harm to the adversary. Well, the interpretive guidance tells us what harm is. I will read it to you. The act must be likely to adversely affect, to adversely affect the military operations or military capacity of a party to an armed conflict, or alternatively, and then the rest really doesn't matter for our purposes, to adversely affect the military operations or the military capacity. What both of you keep thinking about is military capacity. But to the extent that I cannot, as a matter of law, conduct that operation, my operation has been adversely affected. I have to shoot another target. I have to use another weapon. I have to come up with a different operational uh, uh, plan to achieve my, to achieve my objectives. And, and Marco, you're right that it doesn't affect my ability to conduct the attack because if I'm in my jet, I can pickle off my bomb regardless of whether it's legal or not. But surely your argument is not that, oh, Mike, it doesn't adversely affect you because you, cannot, you can drop the bomb thereby not only driving your state into a LOAC violation, an IHL violation, but also causing your pilot and your planners to commit a war crime. Surely you can't focus only on the physical act. Um, thank you so much. I'll try and be very brief. Um, regarding what you said about moral versus legal responsibility, I don't actually take the US law of war manual to 
self-consciously speak about morality. I think it just creeps in. But nothing much changes for my point if you take out moral responsibility and just every single time ex replace it with legal, That's right? Good. I mean, the thing, our difference, I think, is interpreting the question whether it is ex post facto or before the attack, right? And before the attack, we use the word responsibility as in um, standard of care. And I agree, the question is more complicated that way. But the way it is often used in public commentary and interestingly, surprisingly, worryingly in the US Law of War Manual is as if ex post facto responsibility could be divided up and, you know, put on the user so as to absolve the attacker. But let me talk a little bit very briefly about this relationship between law and morality and why we should care about morality. Because I utterly... I think we should care about morality. No, no, no. And I realize we do care about morality, <laughs> right? i nice guy. But I know. <laughs> um, I utterly agree with you. IHL can have no pretense at making war either fair or just, right? Morally speaking, that's utterly impossible as long as we uphold the distinction between the legal regulation of resort and conduct and the symmetry between belligerents, right? In, as long as that's the case, and that's the case for very, very good reasons, law, IHL cannot possibly be in the business of allocating war, harm in war in line with moral liability or desert. Right? But that doesn't mean that we don't need to have the morally the best moral law possible. Right? We can't have a law that simply repeats moral categories because war is too complex, the epistemic thresholds are too high, we would probably end up with militarily useless and morally perverse law. Right? But that doesn't mean we can simply say it doesn't matter whether law is morally correct or it doesn't matter whether law plays out in a morally perverse or non-perverse way on the battlefield. Right? And there is definitely time and place for reifying the law, for just taking it at its value, for just trying to interpret it, not questioning it, and the battlefield itself is probably that place. But I think outside the battlefield, we have a responsibility to understand that international humanitarian law, like all law, is a human construct. Every single recognized source of international law is an instantiation of human judgment of how we should or should not kill people and break things. Right? This is the judgment either of a judge, a military advisor to the foreign ministry, a scholar, right? um, anybody who actually decides how to act in war. And I think we owe it to the soldier looking towards the law for guidance as to how to protect their moral integrity, how to deliver an incredibly difficult duty, to have that law actually be meaningful, right? Why should you obey the law if it didn't, at least to the extent possible, protect you from committing moral wrong on the battlefield? And specifically in democratic societies, I think um, we are asking combatants to kill on our behalf and all we give them is the law to guide their actions. We owe it to them to ask, is that the morally best law? Right. Whose intuitions, whose moral intuitions have influenced the law, whose values, whose interests does it actually reflect, and is that the kind of law we want to have and we should have? Right. And again, I'm not saying all lawyers need to be in the business of doing that or we need to do that on the battlefield. There is a place for pure black letter exegesis. But beyond that, I also think that is something that specifically democratic societies owe their own militaries, is to deconstruct international humanitarian law precisely because it can't easily track moral categories and ask, right, to what extent is that the kind of law we want? And when it is so utterly open-ended as IHL often is, how should we interpret it so as to best track the kind of values we want to protect in war? Uh, thank you very much. I admit that the extreme case made by Michael is a good point, but in my view, simply it doesn't change the law. To say, in the extreme case, voluntary human shields make it impossible to attack a military objective, and this is shocking, but they remain nevertheless civilians. Uh, if you really consider that they may be, that they directly participate in hostilities, this needs, means necessarily the commander could send his snipers and target them individually on the uh, military objective, simply to kill them individually, and then you have no more uh, uh, human shields. Now, I must again explain my uh, 
argument about adversely affect military operations, at least under your theory, they don't adversely affect at all because they directly participate and therefore the one who attacks will not commit a war crime and will not commit a violation of IHL. And this is why the theory is self-defeating because it is precisely in your theory calling that they directly participate that they don't adversely affect at all the operations. Oh, I see. Uh, That's very clever. <laughs> it's very clever. Yeah, perfect. Okay. You should write for my journal. This yes. <laughs> okay. No, I wrote it in the Festschrift board. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. And, and then finally, uh, arts of democratic societies, I'm always, I must unfortunately say, skeptical of making different rules or different considerations for democratic societies and other societies. And I would be already happy when all societies, including democratic societies, were simply uh, respecting the black letter law. When they start to deconstruct my experience, including with democratic societies, including in a democracy like Switzerland, where fortunately they don't make any war, uh, when the people votes, the outcome is not always a good uh, outcome. And therefore, uh, to say we have to deconstruct, I'm too afraid that then there will be plenty of double standards, passions, saying terrorist, saying Islamic State. It is astonishing how in democratic societies, which were very excited about every single victim in the Pakistani tribal areas, suddenly in Syria, as the Islamic State is so bad, these civilians don't count. So, I prefer to live with the law as it is, or hopefully we improve uh, the, the law, but presently this is not at all the atmosphere. We have some time for questions. Okay, so let's start lower down. Thank you. Um, so first of all, thank you to, uh, I want to thank all of you for this very interesting uh, conference. Um, so I'm Lars Beverly, I'm a student at the Geneva Academy, and I would like to have your uh, view on what I'm going to say, because I'm wondering if the distinction between a voluntary and involuntary human shields is not irrelevant. Uh, for two reasons. Uh, the first reason, which is a legal reason, a reason, sorry, is that I do not think that there is any element of intent in the additional protocols when it comes to uh, the um, to uh, the direct participation in hostilities. Um, uh, so, so yeah. What if uh, the only fact of being a human shield is not sufficient to be considered as directly participating in hostility? And the second uh, reason, which is uh, more practical, is that despite what Mr. Schmidt said, uh, I believe that it can be very hard on the ground to determine whether it is voluntary or involuntary uh, human shield. Um, and moreover, human shielding is not so much only a legal attempt, in my opinion, to undermine the military capacity of the enemy, but also a uh, physical attempt, because you have to be on the ground to actually be a human shield. Um, so what if uh, this distinction would actually be irrelevant and being able to uh, target, whether directly or indirectly, all kinds of human shields because of these reasons, and actually because it would um, maybe destroy this phenomenon. If you say, okay, whether you are voluntary or involuntary human shields, you are a military objective in my eyes, so maybe it would actually make people stop from being human shields. Sorry for the long question, thank you. Hi, thank you for this interesting talk. My name is Kevin, second year master's student in international here at the Institute. Uh, I have a similar question specifically for Professor um, Schmidt. Uh, 
I have to say, I thought your approach was the most reasonable uh, in terms of distinguishing yeah. voluntary and involuntary. Um, do you have a U.S. passport? Yes, I do. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, uh, but of course, as mentioned by the other panelists, it's hard to believe that um, the situation is always as clear cut as the bridge example. I mean, if you are to say that uh, voluntary human shielding is DPH, then don't you also have to establish clear criteria in terms of what is voluntary human shielding? And wouldn't there be some kind of uh, mental mens rea element that would be hard to establish? I mean, if we take the example of um, Palestinians who do not respect a, a warning issued by the IDF, how do we distinguish those who just don't want to leave their homes and those who uh, are acting as human shields voluntarily? And you might say in this case we'll presume that they're not human shielding, but then could you please give exam concrete examples of voluntary human shielding in contemporary armed conflicts? Thank you. Hello, my name is Aliki and I'm also second year Master in International Law student. I would like to ask about the US military manual and its reference to honor that actually there are six principles and then military necessity, humanity and honor are the three cardinal ones. And then proportionality and distinction, they are subsumed to the other three. So I would like to ask from this perspective, since honor makes reference to chivalry and symmetry of belligerence, etc., if indeed uh, there is a clear distinction between morality and law, and what's the role in, of honor in human shield? Just on the, your argument is correct that logically Michael should also consider involuntary human shields as directly participating in hostilities. I mean, for my son, no one asks whether he wanted to join the army, as is the case in the US, or as in Switzerland, you have to join the army. So it doesn't make a difference, indeed. So uh, I've always believed that intent is an element of uh, DPH, that if you have a person who finds themselves in a situation where they do in fact adversely affect the enemy's uh, military operations, that that person is not a direct participant. And the classic example would be uh, people that are fleeing hostilities and they're along a road that uh, your troops need to pass up. They're clearly not direct participants. So I do believe you must intend to preclude an attack on a combatant, um, a direct participant in hostilities, or a military objective. With regard to the making everyone, if I understood the, if I understood the argument, or the potential argument right, maybe I didn't, it's that if we made everyone a target, this would create deterrence and there would be less human shielding. Uh, so, I, I get the logic. I mean, I, I get the logic. It, 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 it appalls my moral compass to, to deprive individuals of what I believe IHL provides them has a protection, so has to deter them from, uh, from engaging in conduct that is problematic. Um, I, yeah, yeah, yes. It's a... It's a moral issue, it's not the law, and I'm not certain has someone who works at a war college, I've been to a war college, that that would even necessarily work because uh, people get fired up with the emotion of armed conflict. I mean, as you can see, for example, by uh, uh, suicide bombers, just as an example. Um, in, in all of this, I want to emphasize that my position with respect to individuals that you're looking at in the battle space who may be in a situation of human shielding, I buy into the presumption of doubt set forth in the additional protocol. Indeed, I believe that presumption, uh, or I'm sorry, presumption of civilian status in the case of doubt or presumption of 
involuntary shielding in cases of doubt. I believe that's customary international law. And how would we define that? Well, it's been defined in a number of manuals Marco and I have participated in. And it's it, paraphrased, it's the sort of situation that would cause a reasonable commander to hesitate in those circumstances. Now, I hasten to add, as I said in my remarks, that the Department of Defense manual does not adopt this view precisely. And to be frank with you, when I read the Department of Defense manual on the issue of doubt, I'm not quite sure what they're trying to say. But what I know is I believe that it is a customary norm. And therefore, if you are facing a situation and you have any doubt, then you revert to the involuntary shield. Uh, contemporary examples, there are lots of examples of both doubt and, uh, and the absence of doubt. For example, uh, I was recently, six months ago, I spent some time in Israel looking at their targeting, um, their targeting procedures. I wrote an article on it in an American journal. And uh, I, what happens when the Israelis comply with the obligation to give warning of attack, that fact that a warning has been given that that particular facility will be attacked, usually a building uh, that's serving as a command and control facility, as soon as that warning is given, the word goes out into the neighborhood and everyone goes to that building. And you've certainly seen the pictures where there are a bunch of people on top of the building, they're all waving uh, flags. So has to alert the Israelis that we're up here, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I think there are certain circumstances where it's pretty clear, or at, re at least you can reasonably conclude, because remember, IHL never requires you to get it right, it requires you to be reasonable. And so I think there are many circumstances where you can reasonably conclude that you don't have the sort of doubt that would cause uh, a commander in same or similar circumstances to hesitate. And finally, with regard to the humanity honor, uh, so I don't agree with the way they've set out these rules, I'm sorry, these principles of IHL. I think they're confused. I will tell you that I think, for example, that there are two foundational principles. Their humanity and uh, military necessity. These are principles that you find pervading the entire body of IHL. Then there are general principles. The best example is distinction, but the prohibition on unnecessary suffering uh, would be another, cited in the nuclear weapons case. And then beneath this, you have rules of IHL. A rule of IHL would be do not attack civilians, uh, do not conduct an attack when you believe that the incidental injury uh, that is likely to result is going to be excessive relative to the anticipated military advantage. So I don't buy all of those. What they're talking about in honor, though, is not morality. It's chivalry. It's the old Middle Ages. There are things that honorable people don't do. Um, an example would be to honor the flag of uh, truce, I think would be an example of chivalry. Although I will tell you, almost no one talks about chivalry or honor anymore. They look to the treaties and the rules on the conduct of hostilities and so forth. Uh, yeah, I'm just going to focus on the last question. Um, I think you're onto something, right? It's, the tone suggests something other than what we are used to in law of war manuals, in the, like talking about chivalry and honor. And I think it's merely not just even the tone, but the numerous departures from what we would consider the law as it is and what we would also have considered the US position on the law as it is uh, two years ago, right? just drives home the point that um, interpretations of law are invariably infused with the interpreter's prior commitments to not necessarily just morality, but also their ide prudential ideas about how we should fight wars, their political ideas, their historical understandings of, of uh, war fighting. And so it is a very important and useful fiction that law has a determinate meaning that is objective, right, and that we can't mess with. By no means am I advocating that we should draft international law by plebiscite, right? I do understand the danger in moralizing international law. We need to keep them separate. But we also need to understand that in the end they aren't separate, right? And we see this very clearly in a very thick manual that sets out to articulate the law as it is and just can't help spelling it out as the drafters thought it should be. Right. So it is a useful fiction, the fiction we need, but it is a fiction nonetheless. 
Um, and on the deterrence point, I didn't quite understand the question that way, but it is a very often made argument, so I think it's useful for us to address the idea that we encourage the user of human shields if we keep them immune, and we need to attack human shields, or we need to not treat them as immune in order to deter their future use. There are two problems with that argument, right? The first is empirical, because you're assuming you know why somebody uses human shields, and you're assuming that the ultimate point is to shield an object, whereas there's evidence to suggest that the user of human shield has more or less reconciled themselves with the possibility of civilian death and actually tries to create collateral damage, right? So when you try, think you're deterring the use of human shields, you might unwittingly encourage it and vice versa. There's also the larger problem that empirical arguments around deterrence are always speculations on counterfactuals, right? When you have these arguments about terror bombing, for instance, can't we kill some civilians now so the adversary gets shocked into seizing the war and in the end we save many more civilians? There's no fail-safe way from a social scientific point of ever showing that that's the case or works. From a moral point of view, what you're asking to do is to say, can I kill some people now? as a means to the end of saving some more in the future. That is a utilitarian argument to justify intentional killing of a presumed innocent person. Right? Where that leads to is you to a point that seems attractive, right? at first seems reasonable, rational, but it leads you to a point where you would say, like, well, I know that the best way to end this war is to abduct the 10 children of the cabinet members on the other side and to torture them on national TV and kill them. Only 10 people killed, so many saved. Right? This is the unpalatable, ultimate, logical consequences of utilitarian justifications for killing. And most of us wouldn't want to go there, and international law doesn't go there, partly probably doing justice to our intuition that this isn't the right way of going about things. And international humanitarian law doesn't just address the belligerent and say, kill as few people as possible while winning. It also says that, but it also does erect absolute prohibitions on intentional victimization of protected categories of people, and it does so for very good reason, because unadulted utilitarianism is morally abhorrent in the end. I just want to quickly make a point on the, the intent, because, uh, Mike, you, you gave the example for, for why we would read intent into DPH with the, the, the people say that, you know, the, the displaced people uh, fleeing and they're blocking the road, uh, and blocking that road is causing a problem to, to, to the other side, but clearly there's no intent, so we don't count that as DPH, and everyone agrees on that. But my, my, my reading of this is, it's not that they don't have the mens rea of intent, it's that that act isn't intended. So they're not blocking the road in order right. to. Right? Now, if that's the case, then we don't look for, for the sort of the criminal mens rea of intent in DPH. And, you know, and I, I come back to, to, to the person that's, that's firing a gun. I, I don't care uh, why they're firing a gun, uh, you know, what's behind it. Or, you know, I, I just look at the act, and is that an act that's intended to cause the harm? Uh, and, and in that sense, uh, I, I think you can have Conceptually, you can have the, the, the notion of uh, involuntary direct participation in hostilities if someone is, is carrying out an act that, that the act is designed to cause that harm, even if they don't want to do so, right? Uh, because they, they're being forced or, or, or whatever. So, so, so in that sense, I, I think this question of the voluntary, involuntary uh, brings in an element of intent that isn't there in, in, in the DPH. Uh, and, and I wonder whether that's one of the reasons that we should simply be focusing on direct participation, both for voluntary and involuntary. And I, I, I would argue that there are situations for both of these so-called categories that, that they would be directly participating and situations where they're not going to be directly participating. And so I would, I, I would argue for case by case on each of those, uh, rather than trying to figure out voluntary, involuntary, is this act, does it fulfill the DPH criteria or not? If it does, okay. If it doesn't, it doesn't, and, and just disregard trying to even, you know, get into their minds of uh, voluntary or involuntary. But, but we do, but we do consider intent, and it's very important because intent also tells us choice of law. So if you're, if you have an individual in a situation of occupation, and that individual, and by the way, we train our soldiers this way, and that individual is engaging your forces because, they, because you are the United States Armed Forces. There is indeed a belligerent nexus. Remember, there's the third requirement. That's why the third requirement is there, a belligerent nexus. 
then that person is a direct participant in hostilities, and that person is targetable, loses their protections under, in the case of a non-international armed conflict, 13.3. But on the other hand, if you're, of course, that wouldn't be an occupation, so let's go and go 50, 51.3. But on the other hand, if that individual is committing an act of violence against you for reasons unrelated to the conflict, then the rules that apply to this are human rights law. So you, on a regular basis, certainly in a situation of occupation, are making the call has intent all the time. And your call has to intent will determine whether you can engage in self-defense, which is very limited, or engage in a much more liberal environment. And in fact, the rules of engagement are written in that manner. Because as you know, we find self-defense all the way through the rules of engagement. And self-defense has nothing to do with IHL. So intent does matter. Yes, I agree with you. <laughs> I, I, on, on that point, I agree as well. I, 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 but I don't think it changes the point that I was making earlier. But we can carry on. We, we can carry on. I, yeah. I haven't had an opportunity to think about. Yeah. But, but on the intent part, no, yeah. I would stick yeah. with the intent. OK, well, if, if, if you come to dinner, we can carry on talking about it. Uh, <laughs> All right, um, we have three minutes, uh, so unless it's a super quick question that you think can be answered in two minutes, um, I'll skip it. Uh, no, okay, in, in that case, I, I think we should probably, uh, at, at this point, say uh, thank you to our three fantastic panelists, and, and thank you to everyone for joining us.